And now we come to the part of our service where we ask the Holy Spirit to prepare us that we would be made ready to hear the word, to grapple with the things that the Spirit brings to our minds, the, the issues that the Spirit lays on our hearts. So let's ask him to come and do his work this morning. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, often when, when I'm beginning this prayer in our part of our service, I will borrow words from some of the older creeds. I, I'm especially a, a favorite of the phrase that describes you as uh, the Lord and giver of life, uh, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. And we were talking about this in our uh, adult class this morning, that, that when we try to, to uh, live and move and have our being in this life and we ignore you, um, that that just doesn't work very well. That it's dull and gray. We get so focused on self that that we miss the, the amazing things that you have for us. All of the, 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 the gifts of life and godliness that have already been given, we, we ignore. And we don't want to do that this morning. So, Holy Spirit, wake us up. Open our eyes that we would be able to see Jesus. Open our ears and our hearts and our minds that we would be able to hear the words of Jesus this morning, and that would encourage us to keep running the race, to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We don't want to just claim the name and not have changed lives, so change us this morning. If there's anything that's merely human in this time, Lord, we pray that that would be forgotten, and only that which is from you would remain and chip away at our old dead selves until only the image of Jesus is left. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So, um, my first year of college, I was up at Western Washington University and I Met a bunch of guys in a local uh, Bible study in our dorm, and, and one of the guys was in the Army National Guard, and he just spoke of being in the National Guard with such glowing terms. Now, I had grown up, um, grandfather was career military, dad was career military. I, I didn't really think, okay, I'm going to do this my whole life, but I certainly had a, a very positive view towards the military. And then when I met my friend Rich, and he just talked about how wonderful, how, how much fun he had. I just thought, well, I like fun. That sounds great. Let's do that. So I joined the, the Army National Guard. And in between my um, first and second year, I, I went off to basic training. And he was right. It was all kinds of fun. I, I, I think I might have been doing it wrong. I don't know. <laughs> but I really enjoyed my time in it. And Here's the thing, I processed in up in Bellingham and they don't have a military uh, station there that's full of military doctors. So I got all of my uh, examinations done by a civilian doctor. And he looked at my big thick glasses and let me wear them and I took my vision test and passed fine because I had big thick glasses. So I get almost all the way through basic training and the paperwork finally catches up with me that says, you know, without this guy's glasses, he's blind. He's legally blind. He can't be in the military. And so my commanding officer calls me in and processes me out, and I'm begging him, can't you? I mean, I can see I've got a sharpshooter medal on my chest, by the way. But nope, regulation said. So I was processed out, and it said a medical discharge. So if I could fix my eyes, I could get back in. So I found a doctor who performed this surgery called radial keratotomy. He took a laser and he cut slits into the surface of my eyeball. 
eight slits and that deflated the lens of my eye and made it to where I could see. And right after the surgery, my vision was really close to 2020 because it was the most deflated it had ever been. It was great. I mean, talk about, I once was blind, but now I see. And I've been wearing really thick glasses my whole life. So this was amazing. And it gave me a little bottle of drops. And I was 20 years old and I didn't pay attention really well. And I didn't put those drops in my eye every day. And what happened was as my eye healed from a flat surface, which gave me really good vision, the scar tissue started to build and my eyes kind of went back to where they were. I'm not legally blind anymore. I was at negative 13 and couldn't see anything. Now I'm around negative seven in one eye and I think five and a half in the other. My glasses are thick, but they're not ridiculously thick like they used to be. Here's the thing. Because I didn't follow the directions I was given, my restoration faded away. I wasn't as restored as I could have been. And so I am short-sighted. So as I was reading the text today, and, I, and, and there's this thing right in the text where it talks about how he's short. Zacchaeus is short and he can't see. Well, that made me think about short-sightedness. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. If you would turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 19, we're going to have a short sermon. I don't know how long it's going to take, but it's going to be a sermon about, a sermon about short-sightedness. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10, page 1630 in your pew Bible. And I am borrowing a phrase from Jenny and listening for pages turning. <laughs> to overcome short-sightedness, what do we need to have? There's four things. I'm going to try and go over them fairly quickly. Let's look at verses 19, 1 through 4 to get us started. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through, and a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. The first thing that we need to have to overcome short-sightedness is the inability to see. The inability to see. We need to recognize that we can't see what we want to see. And in verse 1, I love this thought. Verse 1, Jesus was passing through. Jesus is closer than we think. People don't see him a lot because they're not focused on him, but Jesus is closer than we think. And in verses 2 and 3, I've got a, 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 a first of four thoughts I want to give you. And the first one is about the awakening. Why would a tax collector want to see Jesus? What's going on here? So here's the thing. He must have heard about him, especially about Jesus' choice to hang out with tax collectors and sinners. If you are a Roman, if you're a tax collector, you are in collusion with the Roman occupying forces. And you were allowed to collect not only what Rome said you had to collect, but if you could convince people to give you more money than that, you got to keep whatever you could forcibly extract from people. And often, since you're collecting for Rome, you have a couple of Roman guards there with, you know, weapons. And they'd show up at your door and he'd say, give me money. And the, the tax collectors could set their own rates. They were not appreciated. So here's a rabbi who willingly hangs out with tax collectors, who willingly will talk to them when really no one else in Jewish society would do so. Of course, there's an attraction there. And verse 4, here's the thing I loved. Zacchaeus recognizes that there's a situation that's untenable to him. He wants to see Jesus and he can't, so he moves. He takes the necessary action. He runs ahead. He knows where Jesus is going to be. He finds a good-sized tree and he climbs up that tree. He put in effort to see Christ. we got to recognize that sometimes we have the inability to see in order to fix the problem. 
The second one, verses 5 and 6. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. What do we need to have? We, we need to have the inability to see, to recognize that. The second one is we need to have the need to be seen. We've got to have the desire to be seen. Not just to see Jesus, but to be seen by him. Notice in verse 5, what does Jesus say? What's the first thing out of his mouth? Zacchaeus, his name. Jesus knows this guy by name. He's calling you, too, by name. Son, daughter, I see you. This second step uh, uh, that we're going to look at here is attraction. The first one was awakening now is attraction. And let me ask you this question. Why would a rabbi want to spend time with Zacchaeus, the tax collector? You see, God sees us through Jesus. The word will say, frankly, the devil, the accuser will say, you are a rotten, vile, uh, vile, terrible, awful sinner. God doesn't want anything to you. You're gross. Just go away and hide yourself. And by the way, in order to make you feel yourself better, just go ahead and do more sin. And that just compounds the problem. No, God sees you through Jesus. The Bible says that we take on, that we put on his righteousness. There's a wonderful uh, uh, physical illustration I, that I have done with kids before, where on a, an overhead projector in red ink, you write sin, and you, you write the names of a whole bunch of sins, and then you cover that with a big transparency that is red in the shape of a cross. You put that over the top of it and all of your sins disappear. Jesus' blood covers us. God sees us through Jesus. He can see past our sin. Because of Jesus, our sin is past. So to overcome short-sightedness, we need to have recognize the inability that we have to see. We need to know that we have a need to be seen. The, the third is like it. Let's keep going and look at verses 7 and 8. All the people saw this, this interaction between Jesus and Zacchaeus, and began to mutter, he's going to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. So what do we need to have? I think Zacchaeus gives us this great example of a plea. We need to have a plea to amend. We need to have a plea to amend, an intention to fix where we went wrong. The watching world doesn't understand this. They don't understand this at first. They are judging Jesus because he doesn't judge this sinner the way that they would judge that sinner. And whether we like to admit it or not, the, the world is really right now focused on judging Christians, judging the church. Christians are awful, terrible people because they judge other people. Could, could we unravel the logic of that statement for just a moment? The world judges us because they think we're too judgy, but they're judging us in... But if you point that out, you're going to be the bad guy, just so you know. And, and the thing is that the world doesn't get it. They know right up front, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Well, technically, that's not wrong. Yeah, he, he has. Because he is a sinner. By the way, so are you who are saying this. We uh, looked up uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11 today in our adult Sunday school class. And, and it gives a list of a whole bunch of different sins. Don't be uh, mocked. Here are the 
th these people who do these things are not going to inherit the, the kingdom of God. And it has a, a list of a whole bunch of like pretty heinous sins. And in the midst of that list is slander. So if you point your finger and say that is a terrible, awful thing, you know, one of the other sins, murder, adultery, homosexuality, whatever it is, and you slander, you're just as guilty as that because there are fingers pointing right back at you. Thank God, verse 11 says, and this is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified, you are made holy because of the work that Jesus has done. But that is good news. Verse 8 is, shows an apology. So here's the question. When the world rejects our change of heart, how are we going to respond to that? It is a tendency that humans have to judge other people by their actions and ourselves by our intentions. Well, that guy just whipped past me on the road. He was going way past the speed limit. And I would know because I'm going past the speed limit. But I have a good reason. That guy's just going too fast. Now, wait a minute. Zacchaeus' response here is repentance. He changes his mind. He thinks differently about how he's going to use his wealth. A, a few weeks ago, we, we looked at where Jesus said, look, if you have money, use that money for godly purposes. Use your worldly gained wealth to do kingdom work. This is what Zacchaeus does. He's lifted up in his example. And then finally, the last thing that we're going to look at is verses 9 and 10. Jesus said to him, said to Zacchaeus, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. To overcome short-sightedness, we, we need to have the inability to see. We need to have the need to be seen. We need to have a plea to amend. And finally, we need to have the acceptance of grace. The acceptance of grace. Acceptance. When are we going to realize that salvation isn't the choice to do better? Notice something. Little tiny thing. The very beginning of verse 9. Jesus said to him... <coughs> He's directly talking to Zacchaeus, but look at the way he phrases this. It's, it's as if he's grabbing his attention and yet saying it in a, a loud enough voice to where other people intentionally overhear it. He, he's over-talking a little bit. Today, salvation has come to this house, directed directly into Zacchaeus' face. Because this man, too, is the son of Abraham. That is obviously meant for everyone else who's watching this scene to hear. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Jesus wants to make sure that we hear that truth. Salvation isn't the choice to do better. It's the reception of Jesus. The reception of Jesus on Jesus' terms, not on ours. There are lots of people who think that Jesus is just all right. The Doobie Brothers made a good amount of money singing about that. Not to slam that song, I love that song, but that's not the point. Jesus wants us to accept him on Jesus' terms, not on our understanding of him. This prompts us to change. Change, I love this, isn't demanded before the Spirit brings us to life. Change isn't demanded before the Spirit brings us to life. Indeed, the Spirit is given to you. You are brought from death to life so that you can change, so that you can accept the Lord. 
So I've, I've talked about evangelism a lot. It's one of the things that's on my heart a lot. You know this. So I will remind you once again, because sometimes vision leaks, before you talk to a person about Jesus, you need to talk to Jesus about that person. Using a military phrase, we're calling in air support. The, 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 old, the old preachers had this wonderful phrase called the hound of heaven, a description for the Holy Spirit. God, I want you to send, and the scripture is very clear, that the Holy Spirit speaks to the world, convicts the world of sin. Lord, I want you to hound this person who is trying to live apart from you. I want you to bug them and bug them and bug them about how much they need you. Remind them with the hound of heaven how much they need Jesus. Somebody shared a video with me this past week, a song called Try Jesus. <laughs> Great video, kind of fun to watch. It's about this young woman who has been looking for love in the arms of a bunch of broken, fallen men, and they all have a bunch of different issues, and obviously it's not working. And the chorus is along the lines of, basically, I've tried every other kind of guy. I need to try Jesus. I need to find somebody who's going to love me just because that's who he is. And this is by no means a quote-unquote religious song. Uh, I couldn't watch without crying. Because there are so many people who want to go through life and demand that God meet them on their terms when really the term is surrender absolute surrender jesus you win so these steps to repentance uh, awakening recognizing that the spirit has worked in us before we even know it god chooses us first attraction we are drawn to christ as he draws near to us christ influences us next we, we start to think more and more about you know, maybe I do need to get my life right and I can't do that myself. Uh, apology, where we accept our, or we, we reject our old ways and accept that we need to make a change. This is where we respond to Christ. Okay, Lord, you win. Acceptance. We realize our new life in Christ supersedes, overwrites our old life of self. We surrender to God's influence. Are we short-sighted? Are we able to see Jesus? What's getting in our way? Let's pray. Lord God, we know that there are so many things in this world that can get in our way of seeing you. But frankly, most of the time, what gets in our way of seeing you is our self. I love the example that Zacchaeus set for us all the way back in verse 4. He recognized that he wanted to see something he couldn't see, and so he moved. He changed his circumstance and got to where he could see Jesus. And Lord, I pray for anybody who might be hearing this sermon that we would do the same thing. That, that if we feel like we're stuck, that we would get ourselves to a place where we can see you, where we can receive from you. You're calling. You're calling to the whole world. Help us to hear and accept and follow you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.